Hello, my name is Jim Kosky, and today I'll be talking about ion implantation, one of the fundamental processes used in manufacturing integrated circuits. Now, before we discuss what ion implant does and how it works in our industry, let's talk a little bit about one of the Earth's most abundant elements, silicon. You can find silicon in column four of the periodic table. This means that silicon atoms have four electrons in their outer shell. By substituting different elements into the crystal structure, we can add charge carriers. The more of these special dopant elements we add, the better conductor the silicon crystal becomes. In column three of the periodic table, we have what are known as acceptor or p-type dopants. Elements such as boron have only three electrons in their outer shell. Column five elements are known as donors or n-type dopants, and they have five or one extra electron in the outer shell. Examples of n-type dopants are phosphorus and arsenic. Now, if we were able to substitute these different dopants into the silicon crystal for some of the silicon atoms, we could create charge carriers that would increase the silicon's conductivity. P-type dopants add positive charge carriers known as holes, and N-type dopants add negatively charged electrons as the charge carrier. Now we can talk about how to introduce these dopant atoms into the silicon crystal. An ion implant process is, at a high level, defined by two things, dose and energy. Dose is the amount of dopant being implanted, and energy will establish the effective depth of the dopant into the silicon. There are numerous other variables that can be manipulated, such as incident angle and wafer temperature and rotation, but we'll talk about those another time. In general, we can segment chip fabrication processes into two bins, back end of the line and front end of the line. Back end of the line, the processes add films on the surface of the wafer and use photolithography to pattern and etch to define the layer. In front end of the line processes where you find ion implant, you're adding layers below the surface of the silicon. The photolithographic process acts as a stencil on the surface of the wafer and can be either photoresist or a patterned hard mask, silicon dioxide, for example. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how an implanter works. Now remember we talked about dose and energy being the key variables in defining an implant recipe. Well, ideally, one type of implanter would be able to accommodate all implant recipes. However, as implant requirements have grown and diversified, multiple different implanters are required to effectively provide for all of the different applications. Some recipes require a really high dose and low energy, and some just the opposite and some kind of in between. You can think about the different implanters using a water analogy. High current implanters are like a fire hose without a nozzle. Real good for filling up a swimming pool, but not so good for getting that mildew off your shady wooden deck. A high pressure washer, on the other hand, has the energy to wash away stains and mildew, but you'd have to wait forever to fill up your pool. This is like a high energy implanter. A garden hose is a good tool for a variety of different projects. This is the product that's in the middle, the medium current implanter. A high current implanter is used in applications that require a lot of ions implanted shallowly. A high energy implanter requires orders of magnitude fewer ions implanted very deeply. And there are a whole bunch of applications right in the middle for medium current implanters. If there were an implanter that could do all the applications, it would be a medium current tool. In fact, it can do all of them. It's just that the beam current would be prohibitively low, such that traditional high current recipes would take too long to complete. While medium current implanters can effectively handle a good deal of high energy recipes, there are a few really high energy recipes where you end up losing beam current. Even though the doses of medium current and high energy recipes are similar, you would still lose productivity. Now there are some recipes that a medium current implanter cannot touch because their energy is so high. The physics of ion implant and the resulting engineering trade-offs are what necessitate different implanter designs. The first thing to understand is that an ion beam is different from a stream of water in one very important way. Like charged particles, which is what ions are, do not like to be near one another. Opposite charges attract and like charges repel, so to get a lot of beam current for a recipe that requires a high dose, you will want to make the beam line as short as possible. 
That way, the likelihood that individual ions peel away from the beam envelope and crash into the wall of the beam line is as low as possible. Alternately, in order to speed up those ions and make them faster and give them more and more energy, you need a long beam line. Energy is imparted on the ions with powerful electric fields, and these cannot be safely created in a small space. They must be distributed, so longer beam lines are for high energy. Okay, so what happens when an ion crashes into the silicon crystal? Well, there are a whole host of variables that affect what happens to that ion and the crystal after implant. For all implants, the ions disrupt the crystal structure, creating an amorphous layer. The ions are now in an interstitial state, not being part of the crystal structure. By annealing the wafer in a rapid thermal annealing system after the implant, the energy added thermally causes the atoms in the amorphous layer to move to a more stable state, that of a perfect crystal. With the rest of the wafer still crystalline, the atoms in the amorphous region start to fall into line and reestablish the crystal structure. And the dopant atoms do this too. They actually assume positions replacing silicon atoms that are now called substitutional. This makes them electrically active. In other words, they now effectively increase the conductivity of the silicon. Hey, I forgot to tell you how an implanter works. This could take hours, but let's see if I can boil it down. I think it was important to talk about different implanter types first because there are many similarities, but also a whole bunch of differences. For the purpose of this discussion, let's say an implanter has five major subsections. The ion source, the mass analysis magnet, the beam line, the second magnet, and the end station. The ion source gets the whole thing started. We first introduce a gaseous material into the source chamber from either a gas bottle or by heating up a piece of solid material that has been placed in the source. Once we have gas in the chamber, we strike a plasma by generating secondary electrons from a heated filament. By applying a high voltage to the chamber, a plasma is formed, which is a cloud of ionized gas. All of the ions have positive charges. Most have plus one, some have plus two, and even fewer have plus three. In addition, there are many different ions in the mix, some atomic, some molecular, some from the gas, some from the chamber walls. An extraction voltage pulls the ions out and sets them on their way with up to 50 kiloelectron volts of energy. The nascent ion beam with this soup of different ions enters the mass analysis electromagnet. This massive piece of metal weighing about six tons has precision windings wrapped around a ferromagnetic core. The implant control system can accurately and precisely adjust the magnetic fields by the amount of current that passes through the copper windings. This magnetic field will cause the ion beam to bend through the curvature of the magnet. Mass analysis magnets are typically 90 degrees, give or take. By adjusting the field, we can select the ion we want to implant. Each different ion has a different atomic mass. If we use BF3 as the source gas, we will have BF2, boron, B2, and other ions from the chamber walls. Each one will have a different mass, and some will have multiple charge states. If we want only singly charged boron to be implanted, the magnet will allow that ion to bend perfectly around the curvature so as to exit the mass resolution slit which is a graphite type of aperture. Heavier ions won't make the curve, and lighter, lighter ones will crash into the inside wall. The ion beam now enters the beam line, which is quite different from implanter to implanter. High current implanters have focusing lenses to prevent the beam from di diverging, and also acceleration and deceleration capability, and are relatively short. Medium current implanters have lenses and acceleration and also a scanner that creates a ribbon beam from the pencil beam that exits the mass analysis magnet. High energy implanters have lenses and a scanner and also a high voltage acceleration capability. For the Vista 3000, our highest energy product, there's a bit of a twist. In the source, the positive ions are converted to negative by going through a magnesium vapor charge exchange cell. In the center of the DC Tandatron accelerator, there's a very high positive voltage that the negative ions are pulled into. Once in the middle of the A-cell column, the beam passes through an electron stripper, and plus one, plus two, and plus three ions are created. 
these positive ions are now at a very heavy high positive potential and are pushed out of the column. So you get a tandem of accelerations. After the beam line comes the second magnet. This magnet selects the final energy from the three different charge states. Plus two ions have twice the energy of plus one ions, for example. This magnet also acts to filter out beam-borne particles created by sputtering action, where rogue ions peel away from the beam and strike the inside of the beam line. When making ICs, implant can be used one of two ways. First, you can alter the conductivity of the silicon, and second, you can physically change the properties of materials. The second category, physical material modification applications, is a relatively new set of applications for implant. Before we start into implant application specifics, we need to understand something about the physics of semiconductor devices. Now, we've talked about p-type and n-type dopants and how they can alter the conductivity of silicon, but what kinds of things can we build with this capability? If we create a structure in the silicon where we have n-type doped silicon next to p-type doped silicon, we've created a p-n junction, otherwise known as a diode. This is the fundamental building block of all silicon transistor structures. In a p-n junction, we have a bunch of positive free charge carriers in the p-type silicon, otherwise known as holes, next to a bunch of negative free charge carriers in the n-type silicon, otherwise known as electrons. Now, since opposites attract, the electrons will be swept across the junction into the region with the holes and will actually fill the holes. Now we have a region on the n-type side devoid of electrons and a region on the p-type side devoid of holes that have been filled by set electrons. As this depletion region is formed, an electric field is created that will naturally limit the size of the depletion region. If we apply a positive voltage from p to n, forward biasing the p-n junction until the depletion region shrinks, and then current will slowly start to flow. This voltage at which a forward bias p-n junction allows current to flow because the depletion region is shrunk to nothing is known as the threshold voltage. A reverse bias p-n junction will not allow any current to flow until you reach a breakdown voltage, after which current will flow limited only by the conductivity of the silicon. All of these parameters, depletion region width and threshold voltage, breakdown voltages, and maximum current flows can all be controlled by implant dose and energy. Now that we understand the fundamental implant structure, in part two, we can talk about implant applications.